Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you might be catching this. Uh, hello to all of you joining us today. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Westbridge Church. Awesome to have you with us today. And uh, we also have uh, joining us today uh, our friends from East Lake Church in uh, Tri Cities area, Southeast Washington. East Lake Tri Cities, welcome to you as well. And uh, man, this is so cool that through technology we get to have you joining us. Uh, your pastor, Brent, and his uh, we have just been great friends of theirs for such a long time. Uh, they have yet to be great friends back to us, but we're expecting that at some point in time. And uh, also, uh, I know that through the last few months, since all of the, everything has started and uh, this, you know, season of the Rona, uh, I just want you to know, I've been on Zoom calls with uh, your pastor, Brent, many times. He is very often hammered drunk on those calls. So if you could just have someone check in on him. That would be great. Okay, thank you so much for that. All right, well today uh, we are continuing our summer series and uh, this summer series has been one where we have different people and different voices coming in, giving different talks all throughout uh, the summer. And so today I'm thrilled to be here because today's talk is specifically designed to make you uncomfortable. All right, yeah, two people are excited about that. All right, we are going to talk about the intersection between politics and religion. Yeah, good stuff. Now, I personally have had a difficult time steering clear of the topic of religion in church. It's been tough to do, uh, but I have found it very easy to steer clear of the topic of politics in church. However, whenever Jesus says something specifically that intersects with something that we're experiencing, it's wise for us to lean into and listen to what Jesus is saying. And the words of Jesus that we're going to look at today are um, so incredibly relevant with everything that's going on in our nation right now. Because there is a divide in our nation right now. I mean, there is so much division, the likes of which I have never experienced in my lifetime, and I'm guessing is the same for you. And make no mistake about it, this division that we're experiencing is hurting the church. It's hurting the church. It's hurting our witness. It's hurting our influence in our communities. And the division almost is, is exclusively separated around political ideologies. And here's why nothing divides us quite like politics. Because of this, nothing has the potential to divide us as much as fear. Nothing has the potential to divide us as much as fear. And politics is really a whole lot of fear. And so it, it really divides us because it, it's fear that's dividing us. You can raise a lot of money peddling fear. You can't raise as much money if you're not peddling fear, but if you're peddling fear, right, the Republicans are going to take away your opportunity to vote. The Democrats are going to take away your guns. $25, $50, $100, you can solve that. And it's all fear, fear, fear. If the president's reelected, it's the end of the world. If somebody else gets, re you know, gets elected, it's the end of the world. But $25, $50, $100, you can help. And here's the reality, and here's the question. What exactly is it that we're afraid of? What is it that we fear? And the answer is this. We fear loss. We fear losing something. That's what we fear. And so we fear that something is going to be taken away. If, if, if it leans this direction, if it goes that direction, I'm going to lose something. Something about my life, I'm, I'm going to experience some loss. Loss of control. Loss of opportunity. Loss of future for my kids. Loss of uh, culture. Loss of freedom. Loss of the progress that I've made in my life up to this point. And there is fear for all of us. And it's the fear of the unknown. Now please hear me. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying bury your head in the sand. Never be involved with politics. Ignore the reality of our current situation. What I am saying is that if we allow ourselves to be completely uh, driven by fear, if we allow ourselves to become victims of fear, then not only will we live fearfully, which is bad enough, you know, by itself, but even more importantly, we will become divided. We will become divided more than we ha ever have before because fear divides us. Well, if, if you think this way, I'm going to lose something. If you think this way, I'm going to lose something. And I don't want to lose that thing. And so we have this fear. So the only way to overcome that is protect my point of view from you and your point of view. And now not only are we living fearfully, but we're actually living divided. And yet, if you think about this, I could probably go into our parking lot right now and I could find some cars that have Republican bumper stickers on them and pro-Trump bumper stickers. And I could, in the same parking lot, find some pro-Democrat bumper stickers and some pro-Biden bumper stickers. And I love that. 
If you're looking for a church where everybody is the same, I want you to know here at Westbridge and at Eastlake, you're at the wrong church. And if you want to attend a church where everybody thinks exactly the same politically, I'm telling you, this is not it. You're at the wrong church. And I hope you never attend a church like that. And here's why. Our disagreement, our disagreement around political ideologies actually has the potential to showcase for our community the power of the love of Jesus. Now think about that. It is in our disagreement that we can actually show love in a way that a watching world will take notice. Now, hang in here with me before you get upset, okay, throw anything at me here. If you're watching at home, you know, just throw something at the TV. We'll be fine. Uh, Here's what I'm saying. We can disagree with each other politically and still love each other unconditionally. We can disagree with each other politically and still love each other unconditionally. And so here's what I'm asking. Do you think you could do that? Do you want to do that? Here's what I'm asking you to do. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of your faith and our collective faith? Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of your faith rather than create a version of faith that supports your politics? Which, by the way, is what a lot of Christians do. Well, Jesus said this. I I read it in, in the scripture somewhere, and that's why I'm a Republican. Well, Jesus said this. I read that, and that's why I'm a Democrat. That's why I think the way that I think. And I can promise you that if I had to stand up here today or sit up here today and write a talk to convince you that Jesus was a Democrat, I could do it. I promise you I could do it. I mean, let's just talk free health care, right? I mean, Jesus was dishing that out to everybody. He was healing left and right, no questions asked. (laughs) But... If I had to stand up here and make the case based on things Jesus said and did that Jesus was a Democrat, guess what? I could do that too. And that's my point. Anybody can take different parts of what Jesus said and what Jesus did and make it fit their political party, their political platform, their political agenda. There are, not, there are enough of the ideals of Jesus and any political party that you can make it back up your faith. But would you be willing? Would you be willing? to filter your politics through the lens of your faith? Would you be willing to follow Jesus, which we've been very clear for the last 14 years that this this is what the church is about. Eastlake is very clear this is what the church is about, is about helping people find and follow Jesus, right? So if that's the mission, would you be willing to continue following Jesus, even when following Jesus creates space between you and your political party? or you and your political candidate, or you and your political platform. And here's what's amazing about this entire conversation. Jesus saw this coming. This, this wasn't, didn't take him by surprise, right? Jesus knew there would be division in our world that had the potential to splinter us, that had the potential to tear at the fabric of what the church is actually all about. And so Jesus is having this last supper with his disciples. Now, John records this for us. Uh, We find it in John's writings and uh, in John's gospel. In in verses, uh, or chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 is this dialogue. And Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. And he knows this is probably going to be the last time that I'm hanging out with all 12 of these guys before my death and resurrection. And so he's talking freely. And you can read all through these chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16. Jesus is just speaking plainly. And he's talking about what's going to happen and that he's going to be arrested. He's going to be put to death. And in the midst of all this, as he's having this last supper, uh, supper with them and talking to them, at the end of this discussion, going into chapter 17, he begins to pray. And what Jesus prays is so fascinating. It's something that's actually been in the writing of John in your Bible for as long as you've been alive, Uh, but it's not a prayer that we think about that often or read that often or reference that often, that often. And yet, uh, I think it's one of the most powerful and insightful prayers that Jesus prayed. So in verse 1, chapter 17, Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. This is the hour where, you know, it's going to go real quick after this. The hour has come. I'm going to get arrested. Uh, I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be executed. So the hour has come. Glorify your son. That, That just means light me up in such a way that people recognize who I am. 
Light me up in such a way that people recognize I've come from you. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Light me up in such a way that people recognize who I am so that I can light you up in such a way so that people know that we are connected. The hour has come. Three and a half years of walking with these guys and teaching them and telling them what was going to happen and then spending the last few hours talking to them and preparing them and, and teaching them. And he prays, okay, the hour is here. Guys, we're at that hour. But before I'm arrested and before all this stuff starts happening and all of these events kick off, there's something I've got to pray. There's something I've got to ask of you, Heavenly Father. And as we look to verse 11, here's what Jesus prays. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. So that, there's a reason Jesus prays for their protection. And again, we don't read this very often. We don't read these verses very often uh, or think about this prayer very often, but it's always been there. It's kind of like the movie The Wizard of Oz, right? It's like that movie should have been five minutes long. She was wearing the ruby red slippers the whole time. And in the same way, this prayer has always been here, but we just miss it. And Jesus prays for their protection. But as you read through this prayer, he says, I I pray that you would protect them, and there's a reason for it. He's not praying for their physical protection. In fact, he just got done telling them in the previous chapters what's going to happen to them, that they're going to face incredible persecution because they follow him. That they're going to face incredible hardship, that they're going to face incredible difficulty. And that many of them are not only going to be persecuted, but probably put to death for preaching his name. And so he's not praying for their physical protection. He is praying for something that he believes is even more important than their physical protection. So he's praying, he says, by the power of your name, protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. This is what Jesus prayed for. This was so important to Jesus that in the final prayer that he prayed for his disciples before he left them, he prayed for their unity. What Jesus wanted more than anything else was for his disciples to be united because Jesus knew as long as they were in lockstep with each other and in lockstep with his heavenly father, the world would change. The world would take notice of a group of people who were so united that even when they disagreed with each other, they still loved each other unconditionally. Jesus knew that would be noticed in our world. But if they ever lost that unity, if they ever became splintered, this movement would stall out. And then as we keep reading down in verse 20, Jesus actually prays for you. And Jesus prays for me. Jesus sees into the future. He kind of reaches into the future and he begins to pray for you and he begins to pray for me. In fact, listen to this. In verse 20, he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, referencing the ones that are sitting right with him, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Jesus is saying, look, (laughs) what do you think Jesus prays for us? The answer is not what we pray for us. We pray different. My guess is that we almost have never prayed this prayer for ourselves that Jesus prayed for us. He prayed for us in his final moments before he was arrested. He prayed for you and he prayed for me. And he said, look, there's going to be generation after generation after generation that are going to believe because of what these 12 men do. So, Jesus, so, so God, he says, Heavenly Father, I'm praying. I'm praying. Let them be one. And may every single person, I'm praying for all of the disciples through all of the ages, generation after generation, I pray that they will all, all means everyone, all of them in the first century. I'm praying for these disciples, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, slave and free. I'm praying for military leaders and soldiers. I'm praying for tax collectors and from those that they gather the taxes from. I'm praying for the educated and the uneducated. And then all also means everyone in the 21st century. God, I'm praying for everyone who will ever believe in me because of these men's message. It means Republicans and Democrats. It means privileged and not so privileged. It means independent and indecisive and libertarian and black and brown and white and beige. And it means married and single and all of us, all of the people, Jesus says, who who call me Lord, No matter where they are from, no matter what they've experienced, no matter how life has treated them, I pray for 
all of them that somehow they would be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. God, I want them to be unified so that the world will believe that you sent me. I want them to be unified, not just for their own unity, but I want them to be unified so that the world will look to them and see this incredible love displayed. This is absolutely fascinating. Jesus prays, he says, Father, as long as they are in unity with me and as long as I'm one with you, their message is going to impact generation after generation after generation. And so protect their unity. Because if the only thing that will stop this movement from moving forward from generation to generation is if they are no longer in unity, but allow themselves to become divided. That is what a watching world will just walk away from. And so you can see why Jesus' prayer and what was closest to his heart as he thought about the mission of the church as he thought about helping people find and follow him and how it would move us forward, you can see that his prayer was for unity and why that's important. Because here's what Jesus knew, and I think deep down in our hearts, we know this too. Unity isn't an add-on. It's mission critical. Unity is not an add-on. It's mission critical. This isn't just a good idea. This isn't just, man, wouldn't it be great if we could all get along? This is absolutely mission critical. Anybody can love those that they agree with in all things. Anybody can love people who who have the same life experiences. Anybody can love people who think the way that they think, who have the same worldview that they have, who live the same type of lifestyle that they live. Anybody can love those who are like them. But our unity... And again, this is very important. I'm not talking about uniformity. Uniformity is we all think exactly the same. Unity is, we have a lot of things that we disagree on, but we understand this one thing, this overarching mission that we are a part of. And so our unity, our connection, our harmony, and our unity has never been based on agreement in all things. It never has been. Because if it was, that is a very fragile and codependent relationship. If the only way that we can preserve unity is to be in agreement on all things, we will never have unity. I have all kinds of friends who I disagree with on all kinds of things, but we still love each other unconditionally. I even have friends who root for the Packers. (laughs) And the Seahawks. East Lake, yeah. So here's the deal. Our unity is based on something that is much bigger than our agreement on all things. But Jesus knew that we would be tempted to disagree over these things, over smaller things, and that we would be tempted to allow those disagreements to undermine our unity and thus to stall our mission. And because Jesus knew this, because Jesus knew my church is going to be so diverse, my church is going to be so universal, my church is going to be so, uh, you know, around the world and, and so many different cultures and colors and languages and people groups. So Jesus knew this had to be the prayer. This had to be the prayer. May they be one so that, right, it's not just one for their own unity's sake, so that, not because of simply what he wants to do in us, that's part of it, but also because of what he wants to do through us. So that the world will believe that you sent me. His prayer is, God, not just for this group of people here who are diverse in and of themselves, this, 12 group, this group of 12 guys, but for every person who comes after them who will eventually one day put their trust and hope in me because of the message that these guys live out. May all of those future followers also be one so that when the world looks at them and when the world looks at the way that they disagree with each other and yet still love each other unconditionally, the world would be compelled. The world would be convinced that this love is from Jesus. The way that the world is going to stand up and take notice is because the church is so diverse and so different, but they're so unified in their mission. And even when they disagree, and especially when they disagree, they still love each other unconditionally. Who does that? Who lives that way? 
This is what would eventually get the attention of the ancient world. This is what would eventually get the attention of the pagan world. This is what would eventually get the attention of the Roman Empire. And we must not sacrifice our unity for anything. You see, Jesus had just said something else to his disciples, something that many of us might be a little bit more familiar with. In verse 13, uh, in chapter 13, rather, uh, Jesus is talking to them. And it's towards the beginning of his dinner, this, this last supper that he's having with his disciples. And he says something to them. And in verse 34, here's what he says. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. I'm giving you a new commandment. Here it is, guys. And they're like, okay, get, pull out the scroll. Who's recording this? Somebody's got the quill. All right, let's go. Write it down. Okay, a new commandment. Jesus, we're ready. And he says, love each other. And they're like, wah, wah. Heard that one, Jesus. We've, you know, been with you for a while. Heard that one before. What else you got? Give us, hit us with it. Give us something new. And Jesus says, look, I want you to love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. See, that was the new part. The new part wasn't the command to love each other. The new part was the context. Because everything before was golden rule. Uh, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love others to the degree and in the same way that that you want them to show love to you. But here Jesus is introducing something completely different. Something completely brand new. This is the platinum rule. We're taking it up a level. Jesus says, look, just as I have loved you, you should love each other to the same degree, to the same level that you have experienced love from me, regardless of if they love you back, regardless of how they treat you, regardless of how different they are, regardless of if they disagree with you, you are to, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) you are to love others the way that I've loved you. Excuse me. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. They're going to look at you and they're going to see, man, these people love each other, but they don't love each other like expecting something back. They don't love each other in the way that the rest of the world loves. Like they seem to love with this unconditional kind of love. And the world is going to take notice, Jesus says. So after he tells his disciples that, and they've had this discussion He's praying this prayer. He says, look, you've got to love each other the way that I have loved you. The world's going to see that you're my disciples when you love that way. And then he, he's, he's thinking about that conversation as he's praying. And so in, ver- in chapter 17, when he's actually praying towards the end, he's like, God, please help them get this right. Please help them get this right. This is going to be the one thing that moves your kingdom forward. Please don't let them, let them give up unity because they disagree over something else. Please help them to love unconditionally as I have loved them so that the world will become convinced of your love. And then he keeps praying. John 17, uh, verse 22, 23. I've given them the glory. I have given them the glory you gave me. So they may be one as we are one. I'm lighting them up so that they can be a reflection of me and who I am. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus prays for perfect unity. He doesn't pray for political unity. Unity of purpose. That they would see each other the way that I see them, he prays. And that they would see me the way that I am to be seen. And then the world will be convinced. God, you know and I know everything rides on their unity. Everything rides on them understanding that they are one because of me. That they are one because of my love for them. And everything rides on that. It does not ride on their politics. It does not ride on their culture, on their language. It doesn't matter uh, their worldview or the way they do baptism or the way they do communion or what day of the week they worship on. That was what Jesus wanted most for his disciples and for generations of disciples that would come after in his final moments with them. That is what he prayed for. And I can tell you, based on our current climate Based on our current climate, in our country, in our culture, in our society, I am becoming increasingly concerned that we are allowing ourselves to become divided because of fear, because of politics, and that in that process, we are damaging and we are diminishing our witness and our influence with a watching world. This is not a talk entitled, Don't Get Involved in Politics. Okay, that's not, 
That's not what I'm saying. In fact, if I had to title this, I would say the cure for electile dysfunction. That is actually what I would call it. But we live in a culture, <laughs> we live in a culture where politics will always be a part of our culture. So I'm not saying don't get involved. Get involved. Vote your conscience. Be a responsible citizen. You might even say, I feel like a calling into a career in politics. And I'd say, dive into the fray and go for it. But remember this. Your candidate will win or lose in November based on a vote on a single day. The church of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the mission of the church wins or loses based on how we treat each other every single day. That's why we must not let anyone or anything divide us. Think about it like this. Since we follow an eternal king, why would we allow ourselves to be divided over anything temporary? Since our trust, our hope, our security, our identity is found in the hope that we have in eternity, why would we allow temporary systems and temporary administrations and temporary guidelines and temporary opinions to divide us when our mission is an eternal one and our trust is in an eternal king. Why would we allow ourselves to be divided over fear when Jesus' most often repeated command was fear not? He constantly said fear not and the context into which Jesus said fear not was that on the one side he had the temple who wanted to arrest him and eventually did and on the other side he had the empire who carried out his execution. And into that context Jesus says, hey guys, fear not. A king has come. And here's the thing. Your views change all the time anyways, don't they? I can remember there are so many things that I believed in so firmly when I was 20 years old that I knew I was going to draw a line in the sand and my thought on that would never change. And now I look back and I'm like, what was I thinking? You know your thoughts change. I just, I just had a conversation with my son who's 12 years old the other day because he did not want to go to bed. He was frustrated that I was sending him to bed at like 10.30. He's like, it's summer. What? Why have a bedtime in the summer? And then here's what he said to me. <coughs> when I'm a dad, I will never have a bedtime for my kids. I know, right? Right? Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Yeah. I can't wait till you have kids. It's going to be so great. <laughs> like, when you have kids, you will beg them to go to bed. <laughs> For the love of God. <laughs> Here's my point. Views change. They change. And I would... <laughs> I would ask you, why would you let a potentially changing and evolving view, why would you let that create division between you and another person created in the image of God? Your view is changing. Don't ever allow a potentially flawed and changing view to alienate you and divide you from someone created in the image of your creator. Why would we not fight for and sacrifice for and work for the unity that our king prayed for. Why would we not want that? And I can say this with 100% confidence. This is God's will for you. Because this is what Jesus did for you and for me. So, how do we do that? How do we do that? I'm going to give you, in the last few minutes we have, three simple ways that I think will help us in our current climate a lot. Number one, listen. That means stop talking and open your ears. Listen. Listen means this. Listen to people who don't experience the world the way that you do. Look for an opportunity to hear their story. Someone shared this on Facebook this last week uh, from author and blogger Laura Fanucci, and I thought it was so fitting. We are slinging statements, sharp-edged like swords, hurling statistics and theories back and forth, barbs from our battlements, arguing over opinions, ready to wound for the sake of being right. But we aren't sharing our stories. And when we share our stories, 
puts a face to what somebody else is going through. Rufus Miles was born in 1910. He worked for three U.S. Uh, presidential um, uh, pres presidents, and Eisenhower, Kentucky, uh, Ken Kennedy, and Johnson, uh, three presidential administrations. And during his time in politics, he wrote what has come to be known as Miles's Law, which says this, where you stand depends on where you sit. Where you stand depends on where you sit. In other words, our cultural context determines our perspective. To a large degree, what you see and how you see it and how you interpret it, those things are shaped by many different factors that for many of us, we didn't even choose. They were outside of our control. Your views, whatever they are, were not shaped in a vacuum. And stopping and pausing to consider that is called maturity. And we could sure use a lot more maturity in our nation right now. Our views have been shaped by where we live. They've been shaped by how we were raised, how we were educated, if we were educated. They're shaped by what we've been told and what we've seen and what we've experienced and what we've seen other people experience. And if we can listen and acknowledge someone else's point of view, it doesn't mean you have to change your point of view. It simply means that you'll have a, a better understanding. You'll, you'll be able to understand a little bit better why other people think the way that they think. And it will help us work towards unity, even when, and especially when, we disagree. And when we don't listen to the stories of people who think differently than us, we have a tendency to dehumanize them in our own minds. We have a tendency to write them off. They're in a different camp than us. And our fear makes us dehumanize them, and it makes it okay for us to put them down because they don't think like we do. And I'm telling you, there is no them. There's only us. So you've got to listen. Number two, you've got to learn. We do not need to be afraid of new information. Be a student and not just a critic. Otherwise, you'll discount anything and anyone that doesn't fit automatically into your worldview. And let me tell you something. This is completely scientific. Lean in here. This is really, really important. Everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to them. And everybody's worldview makes perfect sense to them. Well, I just don't understand how they could think like that. Do you know what you've just admitted? That there's something that you don't understand. Well, I just don't know how they could see the world that way. Do you know what you've just admitted? There is something that you don't know. That is a you issue. That's not their issue. And so what are you doing to learn why they see the world that way and to understand why they interpret events the way that they do? And if you're a Democrat, can I just tell you, your Republican brothers and sisters are not crazy. And if you're a Republican, can I tell you something? Your Democrat brothers and sisters are not crazy, okay? They are just like you. They are simply taking a stand based on where they sit. This week, our... Uh, Government issued a mask mandate. Some of you are cheering that on. Some of you are frustrated to the core of your being. I totally understand. I get it. Uh, those of us uh, th who are in support and need to know what you think of those, you need to know that, who, okay, let me rephrase this. Those of you who support the mandate, uh, you need to know those who think that it's an overreach and think that, uh, it, you know, this shouldn't happen, they're not selfish jerks who just want people to die. I just want to be really clear about that. They're simply taking a stand based on where they sit. Uh, those of you who disagree with it, you need to know that those who are in favor aren't uh, judgmental government robots. Okay? They're simply taking a stand based on where they sit. Well, I just don't understand how anyone can think like that. Then that's on you to begin to understand. Maybe hear their story. You've got to listen. We've got to learn. And we've got to, number three, love. Never burn a relational bridge over a temporary viewpoint. The you beside you is more precious to God than your potentially flawed point of view. The you behind you, the you in front of you, the you around you, the you in the cars driving next to you on the way home, they're all more important and more precious to God than your potentially changing and flawed point of view. Because while you and the person you disagree with were both sinners, Jesus died for both of you. And how dare I burn a relational bridge with someone for whom Christ died? 
And there's not a greater sign to the world around us that we are followers of Jesus. There's no greater expression of his love than for us to disagree with each other and still love unconditionally. In fact, Jesus said, love your enemies. Not just love someone you're having a difficult time with, a difficult time seeing eye to eye with on a particular topic. Love your enemies. And his follow-up was this. If you could learn to love unconditionally to the point where you actually love your enemies, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Listen, learn, and love. Listen, learn, and love. Well, isn't that kind of naive? I mean, that just sounds so simple when you just say, okay, listen, learn, love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of the preacher answer, right? But isn't that a little naive to think that's really going to make a difference? I mean, come on, look around. That, that just feels a little bit too simplistic and naive, right? Let me tell you what's naive. Once upon a time, a Jewish carpenter that no one had ever heard of, who became a Jewish rabbi, that was followed by a small group of 12 ragtag, ragamuffin guys from all different walks of life. They were all diverse. Some of them were fishermen. One was a military zealot. Uh, one worked for the Roman Empire. I mean, you had guys from all different walks of life. And a Jewish rabbi who never wrote a book, never made a fortune, never traveled outside of his home country, he looked at these guys. He looked at 12 men from very, very diverse and different backgrounds. And here's what he said to them. I will build my church. My church. I'm going to build my church. Church meaning a, a, a gathering of people around an idea. Church doesn't mean a building. Church is a gathering of people, a movement of people around an idea. The idea that Jesus had come into the world, that he was God in the flesh, that he was the Messiah, come to show us what God is like. He says, I'm going to build my church around that concept. And, and not even death itself will ever be able to overcome it. And that rabbi was put to death. He was executed as a criminal. And just before his arrest and execution, he prayed that we would always be one. He prayed that we would experience unity because that is what would get the attention of the watching world. And once upon a time, there were a handful of Christ followers and they were crushed between the temple and the Roman Empire. And they gave to Caesar what was Caesar's and they gave to God what was God's, their lives. And the temple is gone. And the Roman Empire is gone. And the most famous emperor in the Roman Empire, in the history of the Roman Empire, is simply a footnote in the story of this Jewish rabbi. Because Jesus said he was going to build his church, his group of people gathered around the revelation of who he was, and nothing would be able to stop it. And he did build it, and he is building it, and nothing has stopped it. And you and I have been invited to be a part of it. And our responsibility is to show our divided nation and to show our divided world that it is possible to disagree politically and still love each other unconditionally while we pray for unity. Listen, learn, and love. Listen, learn, and love. We have been dealing with this since the beginning of humanity. It was fear of missing out that brought sin into our world to begin with. You read story, the creation account and what you discover is that the very first man and woman were told, God is holding out on you. You're going to miss out. And so for fear that they were missing out on something, they disobeyed God. And it caused brokenness with them and God and brokenness with them and each other. We were created to live in unity, in loving community with one another and with God. And from the first human beings, that's been broken. And so now throughout human history, we've tried to fix it because we're afraid. And so we try to fix it and we try to fix it through war and conquering and violence and power and success and, uh, you know, um, wealth, prosperity. And none of these things fix it. And so at the right time in human history, God sent Jesus into the world to show us what God is like, to show us his love, to restore that brokenness. In the ultimate expression of love, his body was laid in a tomb. And according to many eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And here's what that means. Death is not the end. There is more to this life than this life. And you have been invited by your creator to participate in that here and now, today. That you can enter into this life where the brokenness is restored. And you live in unity with others even and especially when you disagree. 
And you don't earn your way into this. You don't behave your way into this. You've simply been invited. And if you'd like to say yes to the invitation to enter into that kind of life and that kind of unity and community now and today, just agree with this simple prayer as we close. Jesus, please forgive my sins and forgive me for the times where I've walked away from you and I thank you that you never walked away from me. And I pray, adopt me into your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to enter into the life that is truly life, whole and healed, unbroken with you and with others. And help me to put my trust in you and to follow you as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, for each and every one of us, may we be one. May we be united around the mission of the church. May we be united around helping people find and follow you. And even when we disagree, help us to love unconditionally. In Jesus' name, amen.